Hello and welcome to How Do Artists, a show that focuses on a single topic of conversation and asks the question, how do artists live, work, play, run their business, stay inspired or handle challenges and adversity from an artist's perspective? Our show will speak with a diverse group of artists and creatives, and you, as our listeners, will have a chance to ask your questions during our Q&A segment towards the end of our show. I am your co-host, Ryan Caldwell musician and producer. And I am joined by co-host, illustrator, and artist, Carlana Pedersen. Thank you, Ryan. Our topic for conversation today is how do artists relocate? Our guest today is Michael Rawls. Michael Rawls is a singer, local singer and songwriter, as well as a piano and guitar instructor. He got his start teaching and performing while living down in Texas. In 2019, he made the move to Chicago with his wife, and so he did with a lot of uncertainty. Michael would have to find a way to rebuild his business in a new city and work his way into the local music scene. Just over a year later, Michael is book solid with students and performing gigs. Along with teaching and performing, Michael has been recording in the studio and is anticipating his first official release in 2021. Welcome. Thank How you. Are thank you? you so much for having me. I am fantastic. Um, I hate to uh, break uh, the conversation real quick. I cannot hear Ryan still. So, Again. yeah, oh. right, Carlana, we are good. Let's see. How about, right. how about now? Oh, okay, now he's back. All right. There's Sorry. <laughs> We're having some weird technical difficulties, but I am fantastic. I hope I uh, that Ryan, that you weren't saying anything super glowing about me, and I just sat there kind of glaring off in the distance like a, a smug jackass. <laughs> but anyway, um, I am fantastic. I appreciate you guys having me on. Like Carlana said, uh, music teacher, uh, performer, business owner, busy guy, and um, just moved up to Illinois last summer and got a really fast start here. So I'm excited to talk about how I managed to do all that. It's no small feat. That's, that is for sure. I mean, tons of people are, are often very afraid of relocating. I know that is absolutely true. Oh, I yeah. also relocated here um, from Minnesota into Chicago yet last year myself. So I completely sympathize with the, um, with the challenges that that it takes to move not only family, but business. So it'll be interesting to hear from your perspective, how you handle those, that entire situation as well. Yeah, it's quite a move. Well, actually speaking of, speaking of that move. So you'd mentioned how, so you, you said you were able to keep some of your students from when moving from Texas, you know, via online lessons. And that's, that's one of the nice, th that's one of the nice perks about being a private instructor is that once people build up a good relationship with their instructor, they don't, you know, they don't want that to stop. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. They got their kid to actually like trust someone. That's crazy. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's, that's something that really definitely worked in my favor was doing the independent thing, doing it privately is, um, you know, I, I have a curriculum. I, I follow a plan and everything, but oh, nice. my philosophy is what does the kid love? What kind of music is going to get them at their instrument with the guitar in their hands, right. whatever it is. And it's just uh, making sure that they're excited. That's, that's the most important thing in the world. And so that uh, that's a big reason I was able to keep and retain a lot of my students when I moved up here. And this was pre COVID, you know, doing mm -hmm. online music lessons was not a big thing. You were, most people <laughs> were like, no, that doesn't work. You got to go in person. And uh, a lot of people trusted me to give it a shot and it's worked out really well actually. And then yeah. obviously rolling into COVID and the lockdowns, I was in the best position I could have possibly hoped for. Oh yeah. No, I actually, I, it's funny. I'm, I'm slightly jealous of that because, you know, in the COVID thing, I didn't do that. All my students weren't, I mean, it was all private students, but I was going through an institution for it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when the whole thing happened, he was kind of sitting on his thumbs a little bit too long and then said, you know what, I'm just going to move on to the next venture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <that's>, uh... <laughs> and all of my students, although he has no dog in that fight anymore, they're all in his computers. <laughs> Cause he did all the scheduling. So oh, I'm basically, I had, had to go and start building my roster up from scratch. <laughs> it's tough to do. Yeah. That's uh, yeah. that's something I'll definitely touch on is, you know, that, that was something that I mostly did when I was down in Texas. And yet I've continued to uh, bring on students since I moved, you know, in an online format in person here in town. And then also um, online in other parts of the country too, just cause oh, I nice. built my online presence and, yeah. Um, 
because I'm, I'm kind of OCD and I like to be prepared. You know, I, I sing and perform for a living. And if I don't feel well prepared, I don't feel good going to a gig. So I felt the same way with this. I made a nice little list about Whoa. how I kind of moved up here, uh, a little timeline, and then how I was able to get into the music scene, keep my business going, all that stuff. Man, um, Brian, who does that sound like? That's that's <laughs> that's incredibly pro. Well, actually, I have a question that that list might help with. So you were so talking about those students. What are some other ways the the stars kind of aligned for you doing this? Um. Okay. Like things so things that were things that were un like unusually easy. Right. Okay. In, in terms of the move and everything, and like the relocation. Right. The okay. Yeah. Um. So the number one thing that I actually put on the list that we were just talking about was being proactive. That was the number one thing. If you're going to move your business, obviously there's, you know, uh, there's going to be legal forms you got to fill out. There's all these different things you have to do to actually legally move your business. That's something that anyone could talk about. For me, as a music teacher, when it comes to being proactive, it was uh, letting the people know that I was expecting to leave town because I left kind of suddenly, but I let them know basically ASAP told them, you know, I would love to try the online format. If you're up for that, I want to be uh, working with these kids still. And I think it gives us, you know, a good opportunity for flexibility. If we need to cancel, it's so much easier to reschedule than someone driving somewhere or another. And so I was proactive that way. I was immediately when we decided we were going to make the move, I was thinking, how can I keep some of these students and not have to start from zero when I make right, the move? Because right. moving is expensive, as <laughs> I'm sure you know. And uh, you make a big move like that, and then you get to your new spot and you have no income, that's probably the worst position you could be in. And so um, being proactive with that, but also with performing, that was giant. And that was on this list too. Um, making calls, sending emails, reaching out to businesses months in advance before I even got here. And as a result, I moved to Illinois. I got here on a Saturday, I think. And my first gig was on Thursday, five days later. That was the hard lesson I had to learn. So when I first moved from Chicago into Minneapolis, I left everything and everyone here in terms of my, my clientele moved into Minneapolis and realized, oh, this is not going to be quite as easy as I thought it was. And you don't know what you don't know until you don't know it. So when I was in the middle of that situation, I had to learn what I needed to learn for the transition back, which we knew we were going to eventually come back. So it was much easier coming back in because like you said, you had a game plan. Mm -hmm. You kind of knew what you needed to do before you were in that situation. And then you had a list of everything that you needed to do and worked proactively. And I, I feel like I can connect with that. And you mentioned OCD. I don't know if that is an OCD thing, but I don't feel prepared for anything unless I have a list of what it is I need to do oh, yeah. and how to accomplish that. And so moving, when you were talking about moving from, from um, Texas into Chicago, did you have support? Uh, did you have any family members? Did you have any kind of support system that helped with that? How was the how was that with your family in relationship to what you needed to do for your career? Because I know that everyone is different, and those that response is different. So, what was that like regarding your support system in that process? Yeah. Um, for me, uh, the biggest reason I ended up, cause I grew up in the Milwaukee area. I'm from Waukesha, Wisconsin, home of, uh, Les Paul of the Gibson Les Paul. So oh, nice. great city. Yeah. yeah the, um, the rat pedal was also there too, I think. That's right. So I, uh, I grew up there and then I went to college up in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and then moved to Texas afterwards. The main reason being, um, the economy's it's great in Texas. I mean, right, right now, I think things are a little, uh, you know, checkered everywhere across the country, but uh, Texas sure. has been booming, especially the Houston area. I have a lot of family down there, aunts, uncles, cousins, all that stuff. And so moving down there, I was kind of excited, get out of the Midwest, get away from the winters for a while and just move down there. Uh, my wife and I, we were just dating at the time. And when we met, we were both in college. I was a senior, she was a junior. I made it inherently clear when college is done, I'm moving to Texas. And she was like, oh, good. I need to get out of the Midwest. So she was <laughs> gun blazing, ready to go with me. So that was an easy move. Coming back up here, 
there were several factors that played into it, but one of the biggest ones is that she's going to uh, grad school at DePaul. And so moving to Chicago, we had a couple different spots we were considering, um, some other places in Texas, maybe back to Wisconsin, but Chicago, we have some close friends here. And then, you know, she's from Green Bay. I'm from the Milwaukee area. It's just a couple hours away. So it, it wasn't a big jump in terms of, I think, honestly, moving to Texas, I felt more secluded because I just had some extended family down there. Right. Moving back here was almost like moving back home. So it, yeah. it wasn't too straining by any means. Right, that's right. great. No, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Well, actually, and that's that's interesting. What uh, what what are so what 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 made you want to go to Texas specifically? Uh, you know, the beach, being able to uh, be down by the ocean. Uh, nice. My family down there was a, a huge factor in it. You know, growing up in Wisconsin, we visited Texas a lot, but I didn't get to know them very well, and uh, I did want to get to know them more. So. I actually moved in with my aunt when I first moved down there before I was able to get an apartment because I was still job hunting and everything. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, I think I answered your question. I totally started losing <laughs> my train of thought there. Well, I mean, you know, and it's, it's always interesting. There, there's a huge amount of cultural difference between Texas and the Midwest. There's a lot of sure. things that are still the same. Otherwise, we wouldn't think King, King of the Hill is funny. Um, right. <laughs> but so what, what's what's one of the things that was the hardest to get used to when you got there? To Texas? Yeah. Well, the summer, you will never get used to it. Like 100% humidity, 110 oh. degrees outside. So Ooh. when I was in Texas, actually, um, when I first got down there, I was fresh out of college, had like a, a psychology and a business degree. I was ready to just go nine to five until they buried me in the ground. You know, just uh, <laughs> I was going to be a, a corporate stooge. And then after doing that for two years, I was miserable. And so... I started doing the whole teaching thing full time when I quit my job. I had already started doing it as just a, a side hustle to pay for my wedding at the time. Yeah. But um, anyway, when I would go out in the summer, I would actually go to people's houses before I started doing the whole online thing when I moved. And so I would go into their house. It'd be all air conditioned, right? I'd come out, get in my car, which is blazing hot, drive five minutes to the next house. And I would have like five extra shirts in the car with me. So I could keep changing my shirt between every lesson because you would just drench through that thing. It was <laughs> the heat was outstanding, especially all the way down in Houston. You know, you're an hour from the Gulf of Mexico, and we got hit with like Hurricane Harvey oh, when yeah. we lived down there. So I mean, the weather is not favorable certain parts of the year, to say the least. But then you know you get to not have winter. That's true. At yeah. all, not even like a little bit. <laughs> we had like a, a quarter inch of snow once in the like four and a half years I lived down there, and. uh yeah, that's, and that's, people that's were kind of special. It, yeah, people were kind. Of, they they called like the day off, no school. People were out trying to scrape their windows with like knives and like credit cards because no one had a scraper. Wow. So I, I have a lot of family over in uh, Arizona, and that that's kind of that's one of the things they say is that you can tell when someone moves out there based on the vintage of their winter coat. <laughs> wow. So true. Exactly. If it's the Leo. vintage of their winter coat. Oh like yeah, you got like the you got like the teal and and maroon. You know, uh, night like shiny nylon of the late eighties. Wow. Yeah. But you only yeah. see those when they go and visit family in other parts of the country. <laughs> right. <laughs> Man. So, okay. So so now here's here's the other side of that particular question though. What was what's the what's one of the things you missed the most after having came back? You know, tri transplanted back up here about texas oh yeah things yeah. I mean, you just um, got used to over you know the, the years you were down there because you were down there for what 15 years no just about uh five a little oh, five years gotcha. yeah yeah i uh, went there right after college and then moved back up here last year and i'm only 27 so okay yeah five years give or take um hardest thing would be the winter like we talked about um last year last year was fairly mild it was, was okay it yeah and uh i love to snowboard so oh, nice. i don't mind snow nice. a little bit but um honestly the hardest thing was you know at first like uh growing my that was you know the first time i kind of went out on my own completely because you know i i grew up went to school then i went to college and so you know i was kind of on my own but right. you know mom and dad are still kind of trying to flip the bills and helping you with certain things. You know, you still feel like a kid when you're in college. Yeah. It's being an adult um, with training wheels. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So, um, getting to uh, Texas 
when I first moved there, I thought I was going to be there forever. You know, I, I loved it so much growing up and I expected to be there forever. And uh, the fact that I went there, you know, was able to build up a business, you know, build up all these amazing relationships with people and everything like that, moving up here and having to leave those people, even the people I still get to work with online, that was definitely the hardest thing was having, you know, just these amazing relationships with people who actually made me love my job for the first time in my life and having to be like, see ya. <laughs> tough. No, that's, that's, that's super tough. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons more people don't move. Most like a lot of people don't jump ship. And I also think that's probably one of the reasons people do jump ship too. Right. Like there's, I I've met plenty of people who are like, Oh, I hate the Midwest. I hate Illinois. I hate my town. And what really it sounds like to me is like, Oh no, you just don't have any like solid relationships. there. <laughs> right. And Maybe. Yeah. 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 But I, yeah. I mean, I mean, to that point that that was something about Wisconsin is, uh, I, I didn't really care much for grade school, high school, anything like that. So I went to college still in state, but almost as far away as I could get from my hometown. <laughs> you know, I, I had some good friends, but for the most part, I was like, there's nothing yeah. that's keeping me stuck here. And then right. in college, I made some really great friends who I'm still friends with now. But after college, you go wherever there's work. You oh, yeah, know, everyone we just went all over. The wind just takes everyone and they're wherever. exactly. Yeah. So let's so, dissect yeah. that a little bit. You you didn't go to college for music. Mm -mm. What did you go to? Well, if you don't, if you don't mind me asking, what did you go to school for? And you said that you were ready to be in corporate. So then, what was that transition that that you said? Oh wow, well wait a minute, I actually want to do music. I mean, you could have picked anything else, and right. certainly anything else, probably along the lines of what it was you studied for. Mm -hmm. So then. What was that process? Okay, so um, I made a timeline for this exact purpose in case you asked about this. Because otherwise, <laughs> like when we had our little pre-talk last week, I was sitting there like uh, four years, five, and you know, I don't want to sit here sputtering <laughs> half the time. Okay, so um, graduated college in summer of 2015, moved to Texas. And then in the fall, I started working um, as an RBT, a registered behavior technician. Okay. And so I was working with uh, kids with autism and doing ABA therapy. Nice. So that was already kind of like my, my shoe into teaching. But before that, the reason I got that job is I have a degree in psychology and then uh, a degree in business management. So the business management makes sense now in everything. Yeah, sure. And the psychology makes sense too, because psychology has, you know, a world to do with teaching. And yeah. uh, so <laughs> I started doing the, the ABA stuff, um, ended up getting a manager job, but then I didn't like the company. So I went to a different company, um, did the RBT thing again, got promoted to um, like a supervisor. And then I was hoping to eventually work at their corporate office and do uh, like human resources. And my, my ultimate plan was to go to grad school and study uh, uh, observa or, uh, organizational psychology and okay. uh, basically be the psychologist within a business, you know, and right, uh, right. that was my goal. But then um, I was kind of just stuck in a rut with the whole working at these clinics and everything. The well, work was amazing. And well, the work's amazing, but it's also taxing. It is. It is, it is exhausting. Uh, you're underappreciated, underpaid in a lot of uh, instances. And I, it was the same thing, like moving up to Illinois, leaving the kids that I was working with at the clinic was incredibly hard too. Like I loved these kids and I loved working with them, but, uh, the company didn't offer much support. I felt like I was just going to be stuck where I was for a good while. And so I'd already been teaching for about a year and a half at that point. Cause I've been playing music my entire life. And then, um, my wife told me, why don't you, uh, you've already got all these students, you're working like 16 hours a day, because I would work nine to five, then I would go teach for three or four hours. That's a hard and, grind. Uh, That's a real hard grind. So you were grind. already teaching music after you'd get off of work. So music was already your side gig. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And so, um, what year was it then? It was uh, spring yeah, well, of 2018. So it was like 2018, after... you reached terminal burnout. Exactly. And, uh, <laughs> I think it was like February when I was like, uh, I'm so miserable. I, I started going and looking for different jobs and everything. But then my wife was like, you're already teaching. You're really good at it. You keep getting new students. They keep recommending you. 
like mm-hmm. just make this your full time thing. And I think I had never really thought about it because I was kind of worried about the legality of starting your own business and thinking it was this big complicated thing, which it, it's really not. Yeah. I mean, no, and um, you already have what most, well, not most, but you already have what a lot of creatives should have. <laughs> That's right. business management acumen. <laughs> I mean, I had to go back to school for that to some degree. I mean, I because when I went to art school, that was a huge chunk missing. And now they've oh, incorporated yeah. that in in art schools and in and, and those um, degrees. So, yeah, you I feel like we're ahead of the game already with that. And that's oh, actually- yeah, yeah, I was uh, it's one of those things like Brian was asking about for like, how did the stars align? Like I was really lucky to already have that business background because I was oh, all yeah. just psychology before. And I do love psychology still. Like if, if music is like my living now, psychology is my hobby. I still love psychology. I love reading about it. My wife's in grad school for psychology. So we'll oh, geek nice. about psychology stuff. Oh, all you two must be great around the dinner table. My <laughs> daughter's into psychology and we are constantly back and forth. It's uh, it's it, a very interesting conversations to say okay. the least. Oh yeah. No, it, it's, it's fascinating stuff too. Just oh, yeah. even, even just how people behave in different situations. There was a, uh, there was a book I read this year about that uh, called thinking fast and slow by uh, Daniel Kahneman. Mm. I can know that. It's all, and it's just all about, he just, he's been a researcher since the seventies in that field. And he was just giving, like, he would go, go and provide a lot of this, these different studies he's done, been a part of, or, you know, looked into, and then different like heuristics of, you know, human behavior that followed those things. Wow. And actually it's one of the things, one, one, I feel like reading that book actually made me less cynical and less jaded. And less judgmental of the people around me just because it's like, oh, you did that thing. You know, that normal human brain glitch that most of the population does. And wow. it's completely unaware of just because, you know, we're not actually thinking about that stuff. Right. Yeah. You, yeah. you go through your life usually stuck in your little bubble, not to call people conceited. But, you know, you have your own things to worry about most of the time. And when someone else does something wrong to you, no matter how big or small, you're like, what the hell's wrong with that person when it's just human nature most of the time yeah and it's like you did like 10 things that day you didn't even think about exactly (laughs) that's true wow it's like you could be cutting people off while you're driving uh, (laughs) (laughs) so with the psychology with the psychology background how has that affected your songwriting uh it makes me way more observant 100 percent. and i i kind of brought this up to you guys last week when we were talking but i said how during the lockdown phase like that march to may time that time frame there i didn't write anything i had zero creativity flowing through my body it was all just mechanical stuff that i was trying to learn at that point because i need to go out i need to see people talk to people see how people act um just anything that's what gives me ideas for songwriting like i need to live my life and be like oh that's that's something that could be put into a song you know you you find a hook you make a a recorder of it you know you record it you write it down whatever it is and if it's something worth writing it's gonna come out real quickly for me if a song takes more than an hour to write then i'm just gonna put it to the side for a (laughs) while it means it's just not time for that song but um Anyway, yeah, psychology, just being observant, that's been a huge part of my songwriting and teaching 100%, watching how the kids act, how they respond to doing certain exercises or, you know, just reading facial expressions and body language when you're working on something, being like, all right, they don't enjoy this, so I need to follow it up with something fun and exciting to keep them here and engaged in our lesson. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Actually, I want to touch on that songwriting thing because that's that's a curious... I've always found it interesting how a lot of how I I feel like most people only write songs about themselves and their own experience. But I've found that some of my favorite songwriters, uh, like Ben Folds being one of them, he almost like he will write the bulk of his material just about other people, other stories, other things outside of himself. Because if you're only looking inward, there's a very small pool of inspiration you can draw Uh from. But if you look at, you know, I don't know, the rest of the human experience, there is infinite inspiration to be drawn from yeah exactly yeah like i said i I need to see other people doing different things and uh i have i have a couple of songs that i've written in like third person now because of uh john prine he he did a ton of songs like that where he would go out of body basically he has one song 
uh, Angel from Montgomery that starts like, I am an old woman named after my mother. And uh, it's obviously not about him. He's not an old woman. He wrote it when he was like 26 living in Chicago, actually. And, and his mother, John. Yeah. Right. So, um, no, yeah, I 100% agree. And that's my big thing is if I sit in my office here, I can get better at guitar. But in terms of being like, ooh, that's something worth writing about. Nothing's going to come from me just sitting here. I got to go see things. Well, you can sit and write a song about how hard it is to write songs. <laughs> I, th I think we all heard enough of those during Those COVID. are so popular. <laughs> <laughs> how have you how have you dealt with that aspect of your songwriting during COVID? Um, just honestly, there was like a, a two month period where I just I didn't do it. I came up with a lot of uh, compositions, you know, different riffs and licks and stuff that I wanted to incorporate into songs and everything. But um, I already have a pretty big arsenal of unfinished songs or just ideas that I've jotted down in the past that I can always go back to. But um, there, there are certain people in the world where they songwrite every day. Like they sit down at eight o'clock with their coffee and it's two hours of writing. Mm -hmm. I don't work that way. I need to have something inspire me and make me excited to write about whatever I'm going to write about. And uh, so during COVID, I tried a few times. I did some co-writes with a couple of people too, like just for the sake of uh, interacting with people over FaceTime or Zoom or whatever. Right, but right. Um, just nothing was going to flow at that yeah, time. How, for me. How, how is that? How, how is how is doing like Zoom? Because I know like Zoom collaboration musically is just nigh and <laughs> Yeah, like I, yeah. I was uh, one of my bands. We were trying to do like online rehearsals for a little bit and just trying to troubleshoot that. It's it's basically impossible. It's not. Yeah. You have to have some mad. You have to have some really impressive machinery to make that work. I was gonna say, yeah, yeah, doing something collaboratively via any video chat it, yeah unless you have insane internet connection like the greatest equipment set up in the world it, you're gonna have like a, a quarter second delay and the whole thing's gonna sound like an atrocious mess so um have your with, own private co-writing <laughs> was that i was gonna say have your own private server for it too right basically yeah oh. so w with the co-writing um like i said uh nothing really came of it we we tried a few songs and the way that we did it basically was we uh, talked about ideas that we had and then picked one and then we would kind of flow from there and do some strums, do some different things and be like, oh, how's this sound? And then we'd respond back and forth, just kind of like we're doing right now, you know, just not sitting there playing over each other because I've done co-writes in person, too. It wasn't that different, honestly. <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of co-writing. Just Whoa. It, yeah, I've never been my thing. <laughs> Ooh, actually, well, I, I have another question. So are you have so have you always been a solo act by design or are there are there musicians and bandmates that you've left back in Texas? Uh, when I was first starting out in Texas, I was 100 percent geared up to just go play guitar for someone. And that's something I was dabbling in for a while, just uh, playing guitar for a band and just doing uh, rhythm and taking some lead, basically. And uh it's because I didn't have any uh, confidence in my singing voice. At that time, I would basically just try to, to imitate the person who was singing the song. If it was a country song, I tried to sing like I was a country guy. If it was a, a blues song, I tried to sing like a, a blues guy. You know, I, I would try to emulate whatever they were doing. I didn't really have my voice yet, which, uh, you know, made me have zero confidence in what I was doing. Because when you try to just copy an artist, uh, you might be able to match them at certain points. But if they maybe falsetto and you don't know that you could just drop an octave lower or stay, you know, where you're at and you try to falsetto with them and your voice cracks, you know, I just, I was not, uh, I was not ready to do that. And so, um, uh, da, 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 da. I lost my train of thought for a minute. Um, no, Okay, so in terms of being a solo act, yeah, so I, I was very much planning to play with a band, but then um, I think just out of uh, just wanting to have something else to do, because at the time um, I was still uh, just, I, I was teaching full time at this time, and I loved it, but I was teaching a lot, and I was kind of like, I don't want to get tired of this, because I do love it, but you know, you do... 40 to 45 lessons in a week you know those sessions it's it's a lot of work oh, and yeah. right now i bubble usually between 30 and 35 which is very manageable for me but you start getting that 40 45 close to 50 range um you start to burn out just like any job you get overworked you get burned out so um at that time i wasn't playing with anyone i didn't have plans to play with anyone 
I was still planning to stay in Texas at that point. And uh, I just started hitting up bars and restaurants and being like, hey, I've been uh, playing guitar for this long and I, I've been singing now. And at that point, I started to find some confidence in my singing voice because I learned to just sing like me instead of trying to copy other people. Amazing. And the fact that I started, yeah, yeah, big time. And then the fact that I started songwriting at the same time, singing my own songs was the biggest way that I found my voice because I'm not trying to copy anyone else, you know, it's right. just me. And right. so um, that's kind of how the solo thing got started, just being like, I want something on the side, something to do on the weekends to take my mind off of other things, maybe teach a little less, make some money uh, playing. And then I just fell in love with it. Wow. Nice. Yeah. No, that's so fantastic. playing with a band in the future is definitely not out of question, though. I mean, um, I was trying to get like a bluegrass thing going when COVID started and then everything fell apart for bands, obviously. And then uh, so I'm, I'm going to try and get that going again. But I do love playing solo. Um, it's made me a much more creative guitar player, especially because you want to try and add in as many elements of certain songs as you can. So, you know, you're using it as percussion, you're playing rhythm doing some looping, playing lead over it, just finding different ways to be creative by yourself. It's kind of cool. Oh, yeah. That is yeah. cool. So I think that uh, answered it. <laughs> no, that's that, that that's delightful. And it's, it's just kind of, it's always an interesting thing because I know some people are very, very geared towards, they just want to do that. They don't have to worry about logistics and stuff like that. But, you know, on the on the other on the other hand, it's not it's not always the most fun to play with. Just play by yourself. Right. I mean, you know, the most soul crushing gigs are much more soul crushing if you have no one to share them with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those can be uh, those can be long car rides home sometimes. And uh, <laughs> yeah, because uh, I, I generally try to play always within like 30 minutes of home from now on, because occasionally oh, I would go yeah. like an hour or two hours out into the, just the boonies of Illinois or Indiana or wherever, you know, and you play a show with like no crowd, no reaction, no nothing, no wife there with me that day. So that two hour drive home at 11 at night, I'm just like, Oh my God, this sucks so bad. <laughs> um, but uh, like you said, the logistics, that is a big part of it. Not having to lug around that kind of equipment or have a trailer, all the other things that go with it when it's just oh, me yeah. I throw up my little PA system, a little floor monitor, and I come with one, maybe two guitars. It's it's the easiest setup in the world. <laughs> and you get all the pay, too. That's true. Yeah. Don't have to worry about that. <laughs> That's true. So what's the best gig you've ever had and the worst gig you've ever had? Okay. Um, <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, oh, the bottom five. You got to love the bottom five. <laughs> the bottom five, yeah. <laughs> I, I'd say probably one of the worst. No, I'll start the worst ones. I can finish on a positive note. There you go. Uh, one of the worst ones I ever had was down um, a good like hour south of the city. And it was just in this boony little town, um, this tiny little bar. And I go in there and there was already a chance that a snowstorm was going to be coming in. And I was like, should I even go to this show tonight? I don't think people are going to show up. And plus it's out in the middle of nowhere as it is. So who's going to be there? And so... I go and I get to the show, I get all set up and then it just starts blizzarding like crazy mm -hmm. outside. So <clears throat> I still played for like two hours and no one was there. And I was like, can I just go home? I'm like, this is stupid. No one's here. And they're staying open. <clears throat> so I finally get to leave like 30 minutes early and uh, had to make the drive home in like two feet of snow that had accumulated in the last two hours. And so um as, as a gig i guess it was more just that it was boring because no one was there you know right. but um i've never had anyone like throw anything at me or be like you suck. <laughs> so most of my gigs it's more just about you know if the crowd is fun i'm having fun and so i've had a fair share of inactive crowds or you know random tuesday night gigs where no one's there stuff like that oh, yeah. um but uh in terms of the best that's a tough one um i'd say probably last February. So my dad was the one who originally taught me guitar. He just kind of taught me the basic chords when I was a kid. And uh, so I've always loved playing guitar with him. We would sit around and listen to um, acoustic music a lot growing up. He would always just sit there and kind of play along with it. I thought he was like the most amazing guitar player in the entire world. And uh, so he came to visit me in uh, last February. So it was like maybe 
three weeks before COVID lockdown all started. Sure. And uh, we were at Cafe and Bar in Geneva. Oh, yeah. Which yeah. I still love that place. Um, it's like the most, uh, uh, most perfect acoustics in that place. It's all wood panel. It sounds yeah. just fantastic. And so uh, he got to play with me. He was doing guitar, harmonica, all that stuff. And there was, it was full in there. It was packed in there. Nice. And people were just so enthusiastic. So having so a good crowd and him your there. Dad? That's yeah, so yeah. awesome. Yeah. So we, we've gotten to do that five or six times now. Whenever I would go up to the Milwaukee area, he would play with me. Maybe even more than that. Maybe 10 times. Um, yeah, he would play with me up there. And then he's come down to visit a couple, three times. And I'll just take him to my shows with me. He'll hold down some rhythm while I play lead and vice versa. And we'll do some harmonies and stuff like that. It's a lot of fun. That's so awesome. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That it's is cool. very cool. Yeah. My mom, uh, my mom also plays, my mom plays acoustic guitar. And so, you know, I will with relative, well, relative frequency go and jam with her. On okay. stuff. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Holidays. Holidays are always the most fun for musical families because you can just jam and it's a blast. My my mom was was a musician and she sang and she played classical piano and my father was a jazz pianist in in Chicago for many years and my mom and my sister and I we used to sing three part harmony all the time and we would just sit and like sit around the dinner table and my grandmother would sing I mean it was just a musical artsy family I love it and we, yeah, and my, I have memories of, of my mom and my sister and I singing three-part harmony. And my daughter and I, uh, my daughter's gone in college most, uh, most of the time now. But when she uh, used to come back, we would, we would sing and sit down and do three, well, two-part harmony. And so it just rem reminded me of my childhood. So I always love that. Um, that's such a wonderful story that you have um, to share with your, with your dad. That's oh, you. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And yeah, him, uh, my mom is a great <laughs> piano player too. And she took lessons right. growing up. Me and all my sisters took piano lessons growing up and everything. And so music's always been in our house and they were all in marching band too. I played band, um, just music all through, through and through. And it, it's always the most fun being able just to sit around and play music. Cause you know, I, I know a lot of friends and families where they spend the holiday just kind of sitting around, watching a movie, watching TV. For me, I love to do something active like that and interactive yeah. and playing off of each other. I think it's the coolest thing in the world. So when, if I have kids, I hope that they love music because that would make me so happy. Well, well, you know, if you do it all the time, then they will gravitate to it. Right. I mean, I've got three kids and I didn't necessarily assume that they would like the things I like, but because I sang all the time and because I always was you know drawing or doing some sort of artwork uh -huh. you know the kids kind of gravitate to that so oh yeah no that, that's that's oh. and i can attest to that too actually yeah. when i was uh when, when i was younger until i was like 10 my parents had a booth at the bristol renaissance fair and one of the things that they would do every i think saturday night is they would have all of the the minstrels from around the fair just go and hang or at least a good chunk of them hanging out on their porch just <laughs> having fun partying and just jamming and wow. was, you know, every single, it was like every single weekend of the summer until I was 10 was just, oh yeah, jam sessions. It's just what you do. But I can, <laughs> I can absolutely trace the line being like, no, that just normalized music for me at that. Yeah. From just right. like the get go. There was awesome. no longer like a barrier to entry or like it has to be in this setting or right. no, wherever, whenever, however, it doesn't matter. That, so cool. that is definitely one thing I missed during the lockdown. I know we've gotten a little off track of the relocating stuff, but I'm cool just having the conversation. <laughs> but um, one thing I definitely missed from the lockdowns and COVID and stuff was going to some bars and restaurants just in the middle of the week. I'd go there on like a Tuesday, Wednesday at like noon and there'd be like a, anyone can show up bluegrass jam, yeah. anyone can show up blues jam and just to go sit there and just lay yeah. down a 12 bar blues while some some guy who's just been working construction his whole life or something just wails away on the guitar and you I know. Like, oh, man oh i wish gosh, you would have so made cool. music you're living yeah so some amazing musicians so i'm, I'm really oh, looking yeah. forward to being able to do stuff like that again that, well, yeah i'm i'm looking forward to hearing that stuff again oh, absolutely I, mean, I was gonna say let's I'm, I'm gonna drag it back on topic for one <laughs> final question 
And that is, what would you say to someone who's apprehensive about making a move out of state for the first time? Um, I'd say, I understand. I'd say, make sure you have a plan, you know, make sure that, uh, I, I know it's exciting to be like, I'm going to move and I'm just going to move there in my car with my dog and we're just going to make it happen. It's like, no, um, make a plan. because <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be miserable. You're going to find out that when you do things last second, they end up being a lot more expensive, a lot more inconvenient. You know, you need to be ready. You need to if, if you're going to start a business, you need to make sure you understand all the laws regarding businesses in that state and city and whatever it is. Um, if you're going to do what I did with the the music and being able to perform, you need to be proactive. You need to call businesses. You need to uh, send emails. You need to reach out to all sorts of different people that could just be anything that's going to get you, you know, in the door. You need to make sure that you've got something ready before you move. I, I'd say that's my my number one thing. And I know you said they might be apprehensive, and I would. That's why I say, good, you should be apprehensive. You need to make sure that you're ready for it. Yeah. And what helped me was local associations. Um, I was a photographer coming in um, to a new state and getting connected with local um, associations helped me in Minnesota. Um, there were the photographers, Minnesota uh, associations that were um, that had clubs and organizations that were there on the ground. So um, yeah, have a plan and then connect. Mm -hmm. Big time. Yeah. Connection was one of the big things I put as a point too. I'm, I'm going to go yeah. through my list real quick, actually, oh, for any of the us, ones that we missed. Give us, so I give can us just... the delightful summary because the networking Perfect. thing is tough. Yes. Yeah, because that was that was number two on my list here. So number one was in big bold letters, be proactive, and which we've touched on a lot. So that's great. Um, and then I said, um, supporting the local businesses, going to those businesses and meeting them face to face. I found that a million times more effective than when I just cold call or send an yep. email. You know, you show up there, you go order a beer, and then you say, can I talk to the manager? And I'm not trying to be Mr. Sly. This is how you get into these businesses. I'm saying go and support them and show them that you actually will take time out of your day to go support that business. And you're hoping that they'll support you in return as an artist. So um, making those connections, but not just, you know, social media, which I know a lot of people think is enough. Now, mm -hmm. I still firmly believe like you need to see someone face to face and be able to have a good conversation and make sure that they trust you before you're going to have like a good relationship business or otherwise. Right. So or a phone call that you can't do face to face right now because of COVID, but old fashioned phone call, pick up these businesses, call them, find out who is making those decisions. Mm -hmm. Talk one-on-one -on -one with these people. I mean, right. there's something to be said about hearing people's voices that still resonates. So hundred yeah, percent. Absolutely. Um, and then another one about connecting that I said was connecting with other artists. And like this is how Ryan and I got connected is just uh, going to other artist shows. That's how I've met a lot of people. I've been like, I have tonight off. I'm going to go to this other guy's show and meet with him, see if uh, if we vibe somehow. And it, because I've done that with a few people now, we'll go to each other's shows, we'll bring each other up and we'll just jam. And it's the wow. most fun thing in the world. So connecting with other artists that way going to open mic nights or going to open mic nights that your friends host, even if you're not going to perform just to interact with other artists. So that's a huge one too, is meeting other artists. Cause that's been a big way I've been able to get into other businesses to perform as well as being like, Oh, this is my buddy, Mike. I saw him perform here at this time or whatever. He's really good. I think he might fit in here. And that word of mouth versus you just cold calling or sending an email is huge. Yeah. <laughs> great great advice that's Thank fantastic you. advice so oh here I'll, I'll fast track through the final one so um all right i just said uh interact with people at the shows make sure that you you know build a community around you people that are going to keep coming back and seeing you to support you uh do things outside your comfort zone like i said i played some real obscure tuesday afternoon shows but i still was just getting experience and building relationships um and then lastly be yourself is a huge one for me because there's going to be a lot of venues that are like, you need to play this genre. You need to play top 40 music. And for me, 
that doesn't fly. I am all over the map because that's what's fun for me and that's what's fun for the people who are listening to you. So if someone tells you you can't play this song, you can't play originals, I'd say avoid that place like the plague. Oh, yeah. Wow. I love that. I love that. And I think that you have like really like solidified help for people who are listening, like yeah. someone who is just trying to get a hold of what's going on and how to get this done. I think that was enormously helpful. So thank you. Yeah, I'm glad. That's what I was hoping for. I knew that if I didn't make that list, I'd sit here and spitball and talk in circles. So I was like, I got to be organized. Well, hey, if you got wisdom, you got to get it down in a fixed, tangible format. That's right. <laughs> Well, hey, I think that's, I think we're wrapping up though. I think we're nearing the end and, you know, I want to thank our listeners and I want to thank you again, Michael, for being our guest today. But here is the real question. Where can people find you? If people want to know everything about you and listen to all of your music, where do they go? All right. So, um, Definitely first, even though I said social media is not the way to go, follow me on social media (laughs) because that is where I post about this is where I'll be and this is when things are coming out, so on and so forth. So um, I'd say Facebook more than Instagram. Instagram is just kind of that fun place to post videos. But Facebook, I always have my events updated. Um, I'll actually be at Oswego Brewing Company tomorrow from six to nine playing some jams, last one of the year. So come on out, drink some great beer and listen to music. Um, And then once the new year starts, you know, things are up in the air right now. But if things start getting kind of back to normal, I'll be out playing all over the place. Uh, Oswego uh, here in Naperville, Aurora, just kind of this whole Western Chicago area. Um, And then I have some demos on Bandcamp. So you could uh, search Michael Rawls on Bandcamp. I got a few songs on there that I just did some bedroom recordings. But both of the songs on there, I am in the process of recording and being ready to actually put out into the real world on Apple Music and Spotify and all that jazz. I'm hoping January to be the first official release of my song, Never Be The Man. So that should be on all the major platforms. It's a fun rock and roll song. Um, so I think people will enjoy it. Um, I think that's uh, that's about everywhere. That's awesome. Nice. I'm, I'm excited to to hear that. So you'll have to... Send us a message and let us know when that's available so that we can go ahead and uh, and and float that out there, too. Absolutely. Thank you again, Michael, for Michael. coming on our show. And thank you to all the listeners who are listening and for joining the How to Artist podcast and live stream. On behalf of myself and Ryan Caldwell, I'm Carlana Pedersen, and we'd like to say so long until next week. Next same time, same place. Bring your questions and your curiosity, and we'll see you then. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>